was by a gentleman by name uh, Rajiv Gandhi. I'm not talking about Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi. I'm talking of the secretary of the DMK called Rajiv Gandhi. They can't even find no Tamil names for themselves nowadays. One is Stalin and the other is Rajiv Gandhi. What kind of Tamil people are these? Anyway, he said that the Tamil Brahmins will be subject to genocide. Openly in a press statement, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, former secretary now, I'm told, of the DMK, again says this, or any of them say this, there's no alternative but for us to get aggressive and take them to court and see that they, uh, they, they, they repent for what they did. Karunanidhi has finally accomplished his lifetime desire. So I, I said, Swamiji, what, what was his lifetime desire? He said his lifetime desire was to take control by the government of Sabhanayaka um, um, temple, which is an ancient temple in the town of Chidambaram. And uh, he said he's taken them, now they are going to d destroy it, because Karunanidhi said, I'll never rest till uh, Sabhanayaka temple is destroyed. And uh, he said it many, many years ago. So you have to take this in the Supreme Court. But I found out that the Dikshitas, who were, had, uh, who were the Pujaris, they had gone to court and they lost in the single judge high court and the, and the division bench of high court. So normally when you lose at both levels, you going to Supreme Court is a tough proposition. So I asked Swamiji, how can I go? First of all, I have no locus and I am not a, I'm not a Dikshita. So how will I go to court and argue this? He said, no, you go. I remember when I was fighting for Ram Setu, um, uh, Karunanidhi got very upset and he said, what is this Swami saying, Ram Setu? Uh, Ram was an engineer. He went and built the, uh, the, the, the bridge. So, I mean, everybody was offended. But two days later, uh, Karunanidhi fell sick. So he had to be admitted to hospital. And the hospital's name was Ramchandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> and miraculously, the court accepted, uh, uh, accepted my petition to argue. I argued, and they, the court laid down what is there clearly in the Constitution, but never been known to the people that no government can take over any temple except if there has been a financial misappropriation, then only that department, that department of finance, but it cannot take over any part of the religious functioning of a temple. A very important moment in our life. And for that, we need to have our sites cleared, our concepts cleared. First of all, who is a Brahmin? Is a Brahmin necessarily born Brahmin and no one else can be? Or uh, a Brahmin can be born to Brahmin parents and become Brahmin, but others can also become Brahmin by the gunas that they have and the Tag that they have done, and the the courage to fight against evil. If you go to the Gita, you will find that various places. Lord Krishna says that gunas are made, at the varnas are made, and let's be one thing clear: varnas are to be separated from jati. Jati is by birth. It is to enable people to not marry within the same blood group because that leads to genetic flaw. Brothers and sisters marry, the children will become, uh, will, be, uh, will be formed a demon that, uh, uh, you know, uh, they will be born by sick, they will be born with the, with the norm, 
This is what the pharaohs saw because the pharaohs wanted to save their money, their, their riches. So they had uh, uh, brothers and sisters get married for the kings or the queens. And they found soon the whole pharaoh sister, you know, legend uh, had disappeared because they all became casualties and died very early. So, Jati was only for that, the blood group. And you know when, when, when the marriages are selected, you, you make sure that there is no clash of the blood group. But that's got nothing to do with our society, except in terms of seeing the, uh, taking care that the future generations become healthy. What I am talking about is Varna. And Varna is described in, uh, in uh, Gita. Lord Krishna very clearly says that the gunas, if you are a jnani, a tyagi, and a sahasi, in short, then you qualify to be a Brahmin. It's not necessary that you have to be born. Even if you are born in a in a particular uh, varna, you can have different gunas and therefore move out. For example, Vishwamitra. He was born in a family, his father and mother were Kshatriyas. But he became Rishi of Rishis. Take Veda Vyasa. So therefore I would like to, uh, uh, to, uh, to remove this uh, false impression that Brahmins are born to a Brahmin family, and that's more and nothing else. And if we follow this example of the Gita, and what was our tradition, then the Brahmin population can grow. Like well, today we have recruited one, we can recruit more. We are only 3% in Tamil Nadu. And it will be less because many people are migrating and going to America and staying there and not returning back. So therefore, in order to fight those who want to eliminate, finish, put down the Brahmin community, for them we need a bigger mass than 3%. And anyone who therefore preach, preaches, I'm not saying you should go and in actually convert people or convert, engage in those processes. But the fact is, you should now think in these terms. Can we? Because we need to fight the menace before us, and for that we need a larger population. So I will begin by this concept of Brahmin genocide, which is the title of the book. Now, it's, genocide is a very serious matter. We saw it in its most ugly form when Hitler killed the Jews and up to 66 million people were sent to gas chambers. So the U United Nations has a special office on genocide. And in that they have listed all various uh, occasions in the world as seen a horrible genocide. In India, after we became independent, the first genocide was after the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi. 5,000 people were Brahmins of Maharashtra, were brutally killed because um, Godse was a Brahmin. It was a senseless murder that we have hushed up, but it's no more uh, something that we can hide. There has been this, uh, uh, there is a possibility any time that there can be a genocide of, of Brahmins. And therefore the book that is come, it's come at a very opportune time and I congratulate you for having brought it out at this time. We have to educate, alert the Brahmin community of the dangers that lie ahead. Now I would say that uh, one of the things that we have to very clearly uh, work on is that we must, first of all, spread the word that there is no difference 
ethnically between the Brahmin and any other caste in our country. And that is done, that is, can be established by the new DNA studies. Studies have been published already in the University of Cambridge Journal of Genetics. It has been published in, uh, in Mysore, the university there. So research has been published in Houston in the United States. And they say that the DNA of the Indian, and ultimately the real test of race, is DNA. The DNA of the Indian from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from, from, uh, from the, the Dwarka to Assam, the DNA of all Indians is the same, and there's no difference. People think that complexion is a factor of genetics, not at all. That's got to do with pigmentation. It's got nothing to do uh, with uh, DNA or race. So we are one country, which means this whole theory of Aryan division is bogus. Where did the Aryans come from? Yes, we have a word in our Sanskrit literature called Arya, but that's got nothing to do with race. Anybody who is a civilized person, who is an accomplished person, is called an Arya. Dravida is a, is a term for region. And the first person who used the word Dravida was Adi Shankara. When he went up all the way, having debates on the way and converting people to Hinduism and finally met the biggest expert of Buddhism and then Mandana Mishra in Bihar and challenged him to a debate. And in that debate they asked him, who are you? He said, I am a Dravid uh, Shishu. Shishu means child. And there Shankara explains that he is a part of India which is called Dravid. And that is the southern states of Maharashtra, um, uh, Andhra, uh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and so on. So here you see you have a clear statement, but nobody reads it because we, our whole curriculum doesn't allow for this kind of literature to be brought in or this kind of historical truths to come in. So therefore, this Aryan Dravidian theory as a race theory is rubbish. And it should not be, be allowed to be in any of our history books. Even BJP with its, all its hectic efforts, even today has had an uphill fight and has not been able to change the history books that were introduced during the British times and continued during the Congress times and may give new, uh, new syllabus and a new uh, set of books uh, compulsory, for compulsory reading to students because there is dispute and there is objection and those who were there in the government, in the bureaucracy earlier they are putting up their resistance, but ultimately we will do it. We will change the history books. I am confident that BJP will come to power, but, but I am not confident about Modi coming to power. That's an opinion of mine personally. There may be many admirers of Modi, but I would like to say that I am only concerned about BJP coming to power because we have an ideology and to make it a personality issue is then we are falling into the same question that uh, Mrs. We, we faced during Mrs. Gandhi's time. So the question is that we need a lot of time to see that these all these things which have made you look inferior, feel inferior, that has to be uh, they are corrected, and that can be corrected only at the school level when you teach the students the correct history, uh, uh, correct history with the correct history book. And this, even parents will have to learn uh, with it because they too have been brought up by on the old history books. Now, uh, as I told you that uh, uh, during Gandhi's assassination, there was a genocide, 5,000 people being killed without, you know, without any rhyme or reason, just because Godse the killer was a Maharashtrian, 
where do you draw the line if this happens it is every day will happen if we permit it fortunately it has not recurred again and but once again when mrs gandhi was assassinated 3000 sikhs were killed and that itself shows that this mentality has to be wiped out it's to be taken out and that can only come when we develop the true history of ours that we are one people who are born here who may have different views we may have different re religious understanding perceptions but as a people we are one people which we have to bring through the change of our history books otherwise one of these days you will find another um uh, another uh, genocide that will take place now <clears throat> uh this uh, second uh, point i would like to make about these reference to uh, genocide was by a name, gentleman by name uh, rajiv gandhi i am not talking about prime minister rajiv gandhi i am talking of the secretary of the dmk called rajiv gandhi they can't even find no tamil names for themselves nowadays one is stalin and the other is rajiv gandhi what kind of tamil people are these anyway he said that the tamil brahmins will be subject to genocide openly in a press statement and so i sent a uh, i uh, sent a petition to the high court saying that this is in violation of our constitution what he has said and uh, therefore he should be arrested but i was told that it was required then i get sanction from the chief secretary so i sent the sanction the, for sanction to the chief secretary and the chief secretary has not yet responded but meantime i got quietly a a word from somebody high up in government i won't say who who said that this gentleman will never speak again so please don't press your court case so i am keeping the court case in, in in cold storage but if mr rajiv gandhi former secretary now i'm told of the dmk again says this or any of them say this there's no alternative but for us to get aggressive and take them to court and see that they uh they they, they repent for what they did i did this once when swami dayanand saraswati was there when one day he told me that uh, karunanidhi has finally accomplished his lifetime desire so i uh, i said swami ji what what was his lifetime desire he said his lifetime desire was to take control by the government of sabarnayak um, um, temple which is an ancient temple in the town of chidambaram and uh, he said he is taken them now they are going to destroy it because karunanidhi said i'll never rest till uh, sabarnayaka temple is destroyed and uh, he said it many many years ago so you have to take this in the supreme court but i found out that the dikshitas who were had uh, who were the pujaris they had gone to court and they lost in the single judge high court and the and the division bench of high court so normally when you lose at both levels you going to supreme court is a tough proposition so i asked swami ji how can i go first of all i have no locus and i am not a i am not a dikshitar so how will i go to court and argue this he said no you go i uh, you will see that you will have your way and miraculously the court accepted uh, uh accepted my petition to argue i argued and the the court laid down what is there clearly in the constitution but never been known to the people that no government can take over any temple except if there has been a financial misappropriation then only that department that department on finance but it cannot take over any part of the religious functioning of a temple this is the order of supreme court but nobody is obeying it i have to go from state to state 
to uh, take examples and try to get it done. I've just gone to your Maharashtra, where the BJP government has taken over the Pandurang, uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the Krishna, the... Uh, ma, uh, 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 Pandarpur, in uh, Pandarpur, where the Vithal and Rukmani temple, you know, it's over thousands of years old. That, that particular temple, the BJP government has taken it over. And I have gone to court, and I think I certainly be going to win in another two months, and it will be freed. But I had to do it, because this is illegal. Then, uh, on the orders of Mr. Modi, our government took over all the 104 temples of Uttarakhand, including Kashi Vishwanath, uh, excuse me, uh, including uh, uh, the, uh, um, yes, uh, the, the holy Shiva temple and the uh, Vishnu temple, they took it all over. And, and the Char Dham, as it's called. And what happened, the court then uh, gave me an interim order saying that the, the treasury of all these 104 temples, will be not in the hands of the government, which is what the ordinance said, but in the hands of the pujaris, and that will not be taken away. And suddenly the government lost interest, and then after my court case, I won the court case, they have withdrawn it. Now the Chardham temples are all free. Now, therefore, what I'm saying to you today is, you have, as Brahmins, as Hindus, we have to make sure that what is special about our, our culture includes looking after temples. And I'm happy to, unhappy to see our pujaris, our, our, our people who are working in the temples, who have given them their entire life for it, who have learned, learned the Sanskrit shlokas, they have learned all the, uh, the scriptures, who perform the pujas, the miserable life they have to lead, and particularly Tamil Nadu. And in Tamil Nadu, we need a renaissance, we need a Hindu revolution, and if it doesn't come this year, it will come in the next 10 years. If it doesn't come in 10 years, it will come in uh, sometime in the other, but we have to keep trying. And you will find that slowly people start yielding. I remember when I was fighting for Ram Setu, um, uh, Karnanidhi got very upset and he said, what is this Swami saying, Ram Setu? Uh, Ram was an engineer. He went and built the, temp uh, the, the, the bridge. So, I mean, everybody was offended. But two days later, uh, Karnanidhi fell sick. So he had to be admitted to hospital. And the hospital's name was Ramchandra Medical Hospital. <laughs> So I wrote him a letter, get well soon, because Ramchandra ji may not give you much time if you, because it's a temple in the name of Ramchandra ji. This is the way in which they have been trying to be debased. But as far as the Tamils are concerned, the, the targeting of the Hindus must end. We cannot tolerate it anymore. I have no problem with them because any time I make a little noise, uh, they adjust and then I get a secret message, you know, to please don't go any further, we have fixed them. But I'd like all of you to be fighters and pursue the matter. The law is in your favor. Make friends with uh, any lawyer you know and tell him, uh, help him, ask him to help you to file cases. Don't take anything lying down. Because we now need a situation where we are no more passive. We don't want to be, um, uh, you know, of the ministers. I see lots of Brahmins who are ready to be secretaries to ministers. I don't understand. Then why are you a Brahmin? You should be, you should be a Kayast or something like that, you see, who does paperwork. This is a, the Brahmin is a, is a most elevated position. So according to that, we must try to live. All that has happened during the British period, all this we I understand. But I would say now you can start doing some things in your own, in your own residences. In your own residence, please try and see 
if you can persuade your children to learn Sanskrit. Because Sanskrit is the language, Sanskrit is the language of the future. You can go to Google and you can uh, Google artificial intelligence and Sanskrit, just that much. And they'll bring out a, a volume, a research volume, uh, published by the uh, American, uh, uh, the Space uh, Rocket uh, Research Center, uh, NASA. And they, their journal of uh, artificial intelligence states that there is only one language with which we can communicate to, in artificial intelligence with robots, and that is Sanskrit. Why? Because every word is precise sound. It will not confuse the computer. If you use English and you say P-U-T, you type P-U-T, it's put. But if you type B-U-T, it's but, and the computer will get confused and therefore won't not work. So today, in almost every research center of the world, in the Western world, Sanskrit is slowly becoming a compulsory language. If you go to Google and type St. James School, London, James School is one of the most prestigious, most prestigious schools of London. It's an all-white school. And there, and they were so prestigious that when Charles was being crowned, a, a, a group of students came and sang a song. What song, I'll tell you in a minute. But first is, if you go to Google and type, St. James School, London, and Sanskrit, just that much. What will come out is that in that school in London, every morning between, <coughs> between a school uh, uh, for, for children of ages of 6 and 11, they have to sing shlokas of Sanskrit in an English school, all white English school. And the same group of students, 6 to 11, came for Charles and sang Sanskrit songs, Sanskrit uh, uh, connected songs in Charles's uh, coronation. But nobody noticed it here. Our uh, new media also doesn't, uh, of course, Tamil media will not, uh, they will probably suppress it. <laughs> but northern media also don't understand the significance of this. Everywhere Sanskrit is being revived. And so I would say Brahmin community should take the lead in this by seeing that all their children have the opportunity to learn Sanskrit because Sanskrit is going to become the language in the future of at least artificial intelligence and therefore the base of science. So, all this is fine, but somewhere, as I have come back to the first point I made as my last point, the numbers of Brahmins must increase. You can't take on you know, millions and millions of people by being a few millions of yourself. And therefore, you must have through the, not by me or anyone else, but by the great sadhus of our country, one of them is seated here, who can make it possible for the society and the, the Brahmins in particular to accept people from who are born in other castes or other varnas, excuse me. And because they are from, uh, have the same gunas, as Krishna said, Brahmins should have. If they have the same gunas, to break them and, uh, and declare them as part of the Hindu community. <laughs> Today we are 3%. If you can be 10%, I'd like to see what Mr. Karunani's party would do. And they will wither away because they cannot manage a larger population. In UP, Brahmins don't have a problem. They're 16%. But they don't have a problem because those 16% form a very big uh, voting block. So I would say, first of all, please see that your children are educated 
in what it means to be a Brahmin and what are the requirements of that and how you can live with it without you know, it interfering with any of your modern occupations. And the second is, how is it possible over a period of time to see that not more Brahmin children are born, but how other communities, <coughs> people born in other communities, because of the procedure, because of their agreeing to or are adopting the necessary discipline of Brahmin to become a part of the Brahmin community. Those who go, say, for a school which is run by Brahmins, and but they are not Brahmins from from Brahmin community, they could be a part of that. But the Brahmin community's uh, numbers must increase. <clears throat> not a very popular thing I'm saying, I know it, but I think from a strategic point of view, I've come to the conclusion that you can't go on, and because anyway, the Brahmin population is also going down. They're more educated, they have fewer children, and then some of, some of them go abroad and settle down. They get very, very cushy jobs there and don't want to come back. So the shrinkage will take place. Or we have extremely poor um, Brahmins who are like Archakas and so on and so forth. So somewhere along the time, they, as a community, we should form a body, which uh, body will be looking for how to get talent from uh, young talent from other parts of our society and bring them into the Brahmin community. Thank you very much.